Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm going to give it just another 20 seconds or so to let people get all logged in, and we will get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the HFMA Colorado Chapter webinar series. Um, make sure that you follow us on our social media to get all of the um, information about our upcoming events, webinars, and cool things we have going on. We wanna take a moment to recognize our annual business partners. Their support allows us to operate our chapter and bring our members quality education and resources just like these. We hope you will take a look at them first when your organization needs services or support. We also want to remind you that certification is included in your membership. Study materials are online and all modules can be completed on demand and at a time that's convenient to you. It's never been easier to get certified. Contact the chapter if you have any questions. If you have questions throughout this webinar, please go ahead and put those in the chat box. We will try and field those as we go. So let us know if you have some questions. Also, today's webinar will have NASBA continuing education um, credits available. In order to be eligible for those, you do have to answer all three of our polling questions. Those polling questions are only available if you're um, on your desktop. With that, our webinar today is brought to us by one of our Silver Annual Sponsors. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Kimberly George from Extend Healthcare, who's gonna introduce us to our speaker, Linda. Hello, everybody. My name is Kimberly George, and I am the Director of Business Development for Extend. And we have been one of your business partners for many years. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Linda Corley. Linda Corley has worked collaboratively with hospitals and physician offices for the past 25 years. She has served as controller for a university-owned four-hospital group and provided insight to clinical and financial staff members on compliant reimbursement. Linda is a credentialed coder and a frequent HFMA and a HEMA presenter. She is a previous college professor who taught financial processes for healthcare, health information management skills, and billing and collection courses. Linda has over 15 years of experience on the national level of leading CDM reviews, coding and billing audits, and providing consulting services for revenue cycle improvement. Linda is a current Vice President of Compliance and Quality Assurance for Extend Healthcare and the recipient of the prestigious HFMA Founders Medal of Honor. Honor. Welcome, Linda Corley. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, I am delighted to be here this afternoon to talk about 2023, the outpatient CMS final rule, uh, are the, the requirements that we will be looking at to optimize reimbursement. And because I have so much information this afternoon on my slides, I am choosing not to show my face but please know how delighted I am to be here. Um, and as Jessica mentioned, if you have a question, I always like to answer as we go along, just because I think that information probably relates um, to the slide or where in the presentation we're currently discussing. So please just let us know those and I will do my very best to answer. I think when we begin this afternoon, uh, the one, difference in this year, perhaps, and next year that I have seen in our guidance is that there are so many changes where we are going back and considering previous comments or suggestions by CMS. And we're looking at those, I think, in this period of time where we are closing out uh, the public health emergency, 
and understanding how reimbursement is going to be affected by some of the policies and procedures that we have been using during the PHE. So the first information I will mention to you, of course, is CMS has approved an increase of 3.8% for outpatient prospective payment. Um, it is based on a market basket update of that 4.1%. I mention that only because I do get questions regarding what is the market basket for Medicare or CMS and why is it um, often mentioned as far as our rate increase, but then is generally actually reduced by other adjustments that CMS puts in place. So as you see there, we will have a productivity adjustment of 0.3 percentage points. CMS is telling us this will result in a total of about 86.2 billion in payments to OPPS providers, which of course we know is hospital outpatient. And that's about 1.8 billion more than last year or this year that we're in. I'll also mention once again, just because I got some questions this week, um, it is still required that you as the hospital meet applicable quality reporting requirements and that your electronic health record has been approved by CMS. So just keep in mind, if you believe that you are not uh, uh, receiving the appropriate update, I would just ask questions about your uh, quality reporting being accepted and approved by CMS, and then understanding where you are with your electronic health record. Um, it's always interesting to me when we start discussing the inpatient only list, because as far as I know, other payers have uh, particularly surgical procedures that may be required to be inpatient, but CMS, as far as I know, is the only payer that gives us a particular list by CPT that is required to be performed inpatient. As you know, if we do not have that inpatient order, at least by the time the patient is discharged after an inpatient only procedure, then the hospital of course will not be paid uh, for that surgical or other invasive procedure that was carried out. I wanted to go back and just mention again, uh, all of these slides truly have come about just because of the questions I'm receiving, receiving either from our customers or other HFMA members, because um, many people know that I'm interest, interested not only in what is in this year's um, final rule for OPPS, but I certainly want to go back and understand what has happened in the past that has led us to certain reimbursement requirements. So I'll mention to you that back in 2000, uh, CMS established our first inpatient only because that is when we changed to OPPS to being reimbur reimbursed under uh, prospective payment requirements. Back in 2021, CMS decided that their longstanding policy uh, was no longer needed and that they would eliminate the inpatient only list. So again, I still get questions about, well, Linda, you told us that the inpatient only list was going away in 2021. However, back in the final rule that we put into place for 2022, CMS did reverse its decision to eliminate the list. For the coming year, CMS proposes to remove 10 services from the list and also to add eight services to the inpatient only list. Uh, I most frequently see this particular Medicare requirement being met through surg surgery scheduling. So I will mention that to you only because I do um, continually receive questions about what is the best way or what do you recommend, Linda, for making sure that we are meeting the requirements of the inpatient only list. Um, these revised services, of course, will be effective on January 1 coming up. And I do have a list of the code additions and removals 
in the back of this presentation so you can make sure to update any software you may have or any information in that surgery scheduling era, area that's being used for the inpatient only list. Now this one of course is so important probably to all of us smaller facilities. Uh, the 340B payment for drugs back in 2018 and 2019, CMS finalized payment for hospital outpatient drugs purchased with a 340B discount as average sales price minus 22.5%, which was quite a reduction for drugs uh, being administered in the outpatient area. Until that time, we had been using average sales price plus 6% for a number of years. That reduction in reimbursement did prompt litigation, and it was the subject of a recent U.S. Supreme Court decision back in June. Uh, on June 15th, the court held that without a survey of hospitals' drug acquisition costs, Health and Human Services could not vary the reimbursement rate only for 340B hospitals. So therefore 2018 and 2019 rates were unlawful. That's what the court decision called them because CMS did not conduct a survey uh, for more than a decade after statutory provisions went into effect back in 2006. And again, I don't think it's, it's important that you remember all these details. I just like for you to understand how we have gotten to where uh, we will be or what will be required for 2023. So CMS did finalize the general payment rate of that ASP, average sales price, plus 6% for drugs and biologicals acquired through the 340B program. However, I read that and thought, gosh, what great news. We're going back to an increased reimbursement. But in, this in the same final rule, uh, we found out that CMS is implementing a minus 3.09% reduction to payment rates for non-drug services in order to achieve the budget neutrality for the 340B drug payment rate change for the coming year. So while we are returning to ASP plus 6%, we will also have the reduction of minus 3.09% um, in non-drug services. CMS also will address the remedy for drug payments from 2018 through 2022 in future rulemaking prior to next year or next calendar year in the proposed OPPS rule. Um, so changes still going on is the way I would put it. But then again, I would simply look for those of you who are um, able to take advantage of the 340B purchase plan, I would just be sure that your reimbursement is uh, around that average sales price plus 6%. Claims for 340B acquired drugs paid after the court's ruling in June have been paid at the default rate, which is that ASP plus 6%. So you might wanna check on that particular reimbursement rate as well for the latter half of this year, 2022. So I'm interested in you understanding what is needed for 340B. And then I do have good news. I think about remote behavioral health for next year, or simply behavioral health is probably what I should say. Patients can receive remote behavioral health services from hospital, outpatient clinical staff, because of the waivers that we have enjoyed from the COVID-19, that public health emergency. The CMS final rule for outpatient prospective payment will continue these remote services as covered outpatient services paid under OPPS even after the PHE expires. And I wanna be sure that you hear that. Yes, although the waivers will be going away at the end of the PHE, 
we will continue remote behavioral health services as covered and reimbursable. These services are generally performed by the clinical staff of a hospital using telecommunications technology that originates from the hospital location to beneficiaries in their homes. Um, CMS had proposed and is continuing to work on specific coding. So make a note that you want to, I, I could not find it for this presentation, but as we get more um, information into new, both CPT and HCPCS level two codes for 2023, it will be important for, understand, for us to understand what those codes are going to be uh, for remote behavioral health. One requirement I wanted to mention to you is that our patients will need to receive an in-person service six months or less before the first remote visit and every 12 months an in-person visit after that first or ongoing remote visits. CMS did clarify that when there is an ongoing clinical relationship between the provider or practitioner and the patient, at the time the health emergency ends, the in-person requirement for ongoing 12 month, every 12 month uh, in-person visits will be uh, applicable, not the newly initiated uh, remote patient requirement. CMS also proposes to permit providing these services uh, by audio only technology in order to improve health equity. And I'm glad to see again, uh, the opportunity for patients, particularly Medicare patients to continue to receive audio only technology services, particularly for behavioral health, that those will be continuing after the PHG. So our first polling question is, do you have plans to provide additional behavioral health services in 2023? We're just asking you, yes, remote behavioral health care, yes, no, or you may be unsure of whether or not those are being provided. So here we have our answers to our polling question. Yes, 42%, no, 15%, and then we do have 42% as well that are unsure. Um, from my perspective, of course, I am recommending that you continue with your remote behavioral health. Um, and then I think when we look at our next slide, we are going to talk about. Um, telehealth, because so many of the hospitals, uh, the outpatient areas that, that we are working with, telehealth has truly improved not only their revenue, but their ability to offer quality patient care services um, to their patients. I'm also interested in your having the latest list of telehealth services. Um, CMS particularly does continue to review what can be covered as telehealth. Uh, and this particular website that you see there on the slide uh, has an updated list of all telehealth services, including those that involve audio only interaction, but are included uh, on the list for the duration of the public health emergency. Um, and I actually, because I stay involved with, with charge masters and looking at what's being reimbursed and making sure um, charge capture is appropriate for all telehealth services, I look at this website about every two weeks because CMS does continuously update the list of uh, codes that are present 
in the list uh, to be sure that you are up to date, not only with what is covered and uh, what is available now under telehealth care, but so that you are assured your claims are going out with the appropriate updated codes. Uh, I think, of course, that always assists us with improved reimbursement. Okay, so we have another polling question. Are you currently providing telehealth services? If so, do you pl plan to continue these after the PHE? Uh, so please answer yes, but we do not plan to continue. Yes, and we will continue or no. Thank you. And, and I think the reason I am interested in these two particular polling questions uh, regarding behavioral health, particularly remote behavioral health, and then telehealth in general, is because we have seen so many hospitals improve, as I mentioned, not only their reimbursement, which is generally what I'm interested in, but also just patient care. Think about um, convenience, all of the things that we hear about telehealth that uh, are so important uh, to our patients that they are able to take advantage of telehealth. So as we see our responses, yes, but we do not plan to continue, only 8%. Yes, and we will continue, 88%. Gosh, that is a great answer. And then no, they are not currently, or you are not currently providing uh, telehealth. Even if you are not at this point, which of course that is a very low percentage, or if you think you may not want to continue after the end of the PHE, I would simply ask that you reconsider uh, only because I have seen, and it looks like many of you as well, have seen um, how this is improving quality of care, the availability of different types of providers or uh, specialists, and then simply understanding what is so important to be able to provide care where it is most convenient or at a time that it is most convenient for our patients. So this is truly good information, I think we see here, good response. So I'll stop here and just ask if anyone has a question that we want to uh, attempt to answer at this point. Okay, I guess not. Um, so we'll move on to supervision requirements for outpatient diagnostic services uh, at hospitals and our critical access hospitals. And again, I think this is new, good news particularly for reimbursement. CMS did clarify in the final rule that non-physician practitioners, which often we you know, have those in the form of nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, physician assistants, certified registered nurse anesthetists, and certified nurse midwives, they can provide general, direct, and personal supervision of outpatient diagnostic services to the extent that they are authorized to do so under their scope of practice and applicable state law. And I think this is an important one that is being uh, not only clarified, but almost increased by CMS so that uh, more diagnostic services can be carried out uh, within our hospitals and be reimbursed appropriately. So uh, I, several of our hospitals have simply undergone uh, uh, almost a test of asking the clinical areas, our departments, you know, are you staffed by an NPP or non-physician practitioner at certain times of the day or on the weekend? 
And do you understand what the supervision requirements are when uh, outpatient diagnostic services or tests are being provided? And I think that gives us good information in our preparation for 2023. So again, that we are, I don't say maximizing anymore, but I do like to talk about um, simply optimizing both regulatory and coverage criteria so that our um, reimbursement continues to increase. We're making use of whatever uh, exceptions that we can. And this one, um, investigational devices. Uh, I just got a question about this week, so I went back and included this. As you know, Medicare can pay for a Category B investigational device exemption, which we refer to as an IDE, if CMS determines the Medicare coverage study criteria have been fulfilled. That says to me our documentation must reflect that we have met uh, the exemption for that IDE study. A Category B device is one in which initial questions surrounding both the safety and the effectiveness for that particular device have been resolved or it is one in which it is known the device can be safe because other manufacturers have received pre-market approval or clearance for the particular device type. For the coming year, CMS has finalized the creation of a single blended payment and will establish again a new code or update an existing code for when study criteria are met and where a new or revised payment rate is needed to preserve scientific validity of the study. And again, probably not a whole lot of increased reimbursement, but I do think it will add to, um, for those of us that carry out investigational device studies, it will add to uh, the reimbursement for what sometimes can be a fairly expensive uh, study for a particular patient. For this one, um, it's just a little bit of information, but I think it's important to us. For that hospital outpatient quality reporting program, uh, for the coming year, CMS has updated that the cataract improvement in patient's visual function within 90 days following the surgery, that measure of reporting for the quality uh, program is going to continue to be voluntary. I think that's important for us to know. I hope that you are, if as you are providing cataract surgery, that you are tracking that requirement or that measure is probably what I should call it, but that you are continuing to understand that when the PHE does end, uh, it appears that that measure will no longer be voluntary, but will be required. So now this is brand new and gosh, I can't tell you how many questions uh, I've gotten about this particular information. A new provider type that CMS is, has named Rural Emergency Hospital uh, has been approved back in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. Uh, a new Medicare provider type called Rural Emergency Hospital was created. Now, instead of going into all of those requirements because we wanted to cover additional changes for 2023, I do show you the website there uh, regarding the CMS fact sheet for this type of provider. Hospitals may convert to a rural emergency hospital if they were critical access hospitals or classified as a rural hospital with not more than 50 beds participating in Medicare as of December 27th, 2020. So that tells you whether or not you should consider, you should review this hospital fact sheet and if you would have interest in becoming a rural emergency hospital. I think there will be some, re, uh, some additional reimbursement. So this is an updated payment model where CMS um, is proposing 
and as far as I know, has finalized to provide a 5% payment for each covered outpatient department service furnished by the Rural Emergency Hospital in addition to the standard OPPS payment rate. However, a little bit more of good news, beneficiaries receiving such services would not be charged coinsurance on that additional 5% payment. If finalized, the, and it's moving toward that, I, I think that's why I left proposes and if finalized in here, it is definitely moving toward this REH being established, however. The payment amount would increase beginning in calendar year 2024. In addition, the proposed rule would allow rural emergency hospitals to provide additional outpatient care outside of those currently paid under the outpatient prospective payment system. These services would be eligible for payment following the applicable fee schedule for the service without the additional OPPS 5% payment proposed for covered services. So a 5% payment for each covered OPPS service and then additional services would be covered and reimbursed based on their applicable fee schedule since they are not under the OPPS. For rural emergency hospitals enrollment, CMS has announced to convert from a critical access hospital to an REH. Uh, the CAH would only need to submit a Form 855A change of information application rather than a full initial enrollment application, which would include a waiver of that initial application fee. So again, good news that you might want to mark uh, in this particular slide to be sure that you include it in your discussion uh, if this rural emergency hospital would be available to you. The final rule also allows for updates to the Stark Law to incorporate the new rural emergency hospital provider type in its scope. Specifically, CMS is seeking to add a new exception for ownership or investment interests in that rural emergency hospital, and also to revise certain existing exceptions to ensure applicability to compensation arrangements where a rural emergency hospital does hold a stake, uh, again, both related to the Stark referral law and making sure that this particular type of provider, rural emergency hospital, uh, meets the requirements for the Stark law. Okay, so here we are with one of the, the topics probably that gives me um, the most headaches. I don't know about you. I should have had a polling question about this one and I may. Prior authorization process for certain services. Now, one of the things that I always, I started to say like, but probably enjoyed most about traditional Medicare was that there were no prior authorizations required. Well, of course, we changed that back in 2020. CMS did finalize a policy where hospitals must seek affirmation of coverage before outpatient services are furnished to our Medicare traditional beneficiaries and before a claim can be submitted. To begin with, this prior authorization requirement applied initially to only five categories of service, uh, and I won't read those to you there, but I did want to list them. So now for 2023, we are adding fat, faucet joint, I still did not say that correctly, facet joint interventions as a new service category subject to that prior authorization process. Now, notice the date, not until March 1, 2023. Um, in the 2021 rulemaking cycle, CMS did expand the services subject to prior authorization 
after we receive those um, initial services that would require prior authorization in 2020, in 2021, two new categories of services, cervical fusion with disc removal and implanted spinal neurostimulators were added for dates of service on or after July 1, 2021. 2022, we did not have any additional prior authorizations that were required. But now 2023, as you see there, uh, as mentioned, the facet joint injections, medial branch blocks, and that facet joint nerve destruction. I think as you see the note there at the bottom of the slide, uh, the news is probably that CMS will continue for traditional uh, Medicare beneficiaries to include types of services in future rulemaking. Uh, as many of you probably know, uh, Medicare Advantage plans have had requirements for prior authorizations uh, from their inception. So this is traditional Medicare beneficiaries that we are discussing. So we do have a polling question. Uh, do you have a prior authorization approval process that requires both revenue cycle departments and patient care management? Now you may call that different things, case management or uh, anything at all to do with patient care management. So if you would tell us yes, you've incorporated those two areas to address prior authorizations. No, you have not, or you're unsure of how prior authorizations are being uh, completed and approved within your organization. So I will go back by way of just a little bit of explanation. I am so interested in, because I think hospitals, we generally provide many of the same services, but the setting in which those services are provided and how the patient is scheduled, eligibility is checked, and now we have moved on to required medical uh, information review. I'm just always interested in how we are achieving or being successful, as our question um, mentioned, with prior authorizations. And we see there that 57% of you have both included uh, revenue cycle areas, depending on where your patient may be, uh, registered or scheduled most probably. 57% are saying yes, no, 14%, and unsure, 29%. So I would encourage you, just because I'm interested in reimbursement, that you review your prior authorization process. And I'm sure that you have because all of us have been addressing this. But I think a blended process, which we probably have not had in our hospital outpatient areas uh, very frequently before, but that blended process of what's required on the um, revenue cycle or revenue integrity side, as well as a clinical review of information. Uh, I'm seeing you know, payer requirements for a particular lower level um, imaging test may be required before you can move on to uh, a more expensive or a higher level CT or MRI. I just think here we are uh, almost immersed in understanding how are we putting into place either workflows or procedures to ensure that new payer requirements, of course, not only Medicare, but new payer requirements are asking us to uh, almost refine our revenue integrity processes so that we are meeting payer requirements to be reimbursed. Okay, uh, I'll mention this one, but I'm sure you probably already know about it. 
to incentivize the purchase of domestic National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health approved surgical N95s. CMS did finalize a payment adjustment for both hospital inpatient and outpatient settings, which of course is new good news. CMS proposes to offset the additional marginal resource costs that hospitals do face in procuring domestically made approved surgical N95 respirators by making biweekly lump sum payments to hospitals that are then will be reconciled at cost report settlement. I just want to get across that be sure that you are taking advantage of this payment adjustment if you are procuring or purchasing uh, domestically made N95s. And I'm glad to see this reimbursement, of course, because I, I do believe uh, it will be not only beneficial, but will help our manufacturers in the US. Next is a brief mention of soul, uh, rural soul community hospitals, site neutral payment exemptions. Again, good news if you are that type of provider. Over the past several years, CMS has implemented a site neutral payment policy for off-campus provider-based departments, establishing a clinic visit fee equivalent to the PFS rate. Um, and I think this is important. We want to be sure one of the CMS main uh, focal points for 2023 uh, looks at our rural and smaller hospitals, particularly um, rural health of course, but, but making sure that patients who are Medicare age have um, access to health care that they need. So for this rural soul community hospital, CMS proposes to exempt those hospitals from the site neutral changes by paying for clinic visits furnished at RSCs accepted off-campus provider-based departments at the full OPPS rate, which is approximately 60% more than the PFS rate. Um, so I think this, again, is good news to see CMS moving toward understanding the type of provider, the location of that particular hospital, and the patients who are being served uh, may certainly affect what that particular location should be reimbursed. So again, just to bring to your attention, if you are uh, a rural soul community hospital, that you are receiving the appropriate rate. And this one, it seems like I've been spending a lot of time uh, on behavioral, mental health, uh, substance, services because they are so needed uh, within our healthcare environment. So this one is about non-opioid pain management drug, drugs and biologicals. Uh, in 2022, uh, CMS finalized its proposal that beginning January 1, CMS would provide for separate payment for non-opioid pain management drugs and biologicals that function as supplies in the ambulatory surgery center setting. When those particular projects are FDA approved, have an approved indication for pain management or as an analgesic and have a per day cost above the OPPS drug pack packaging threshold, they will be reimbursed. Let's see if I have a little bit more information. CMS is adding two criteria for separate payment. The drug or biological does not have traditional pass-through payment status, in other words, so it's not being paid separately under OPPS. So where a drug or biological otherwise meets this non-opioid policy requirement and has pass-through payment status that will expire during the calendar year, so as we are approaching 2023, the drug or biological would qualify for separate payment during such calendar year 
on the first day of the next calendar year quarter after its pass through status expires. Now that one requires, I think, a second reading simply to understand what that's telling us. The drug or biological must not already be separately payable under a policy other than the one specified as this non-opioid pain management. And I do think this is, is good news. I don't know that a patient's care would be changed by this policy, but I think consideration of non-opioid pain management is certainly important where we are today uh, with both behavioral health, mental health, and certainly um, substance use um, patients who need uh, additional pain management. Okay, discarded single dose, single use package drugs. Now I will be the first to admit that this one continues kind of to make me scratch my head as far as why it's required, but to let you know, uh, section 9004 of the Infra Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act amended section 1847A, adding provisions that require manufacturers to provide a refund to CMS for certain discarded amounts from a refundable single dose container or single use packaged drug. The refund amount from that manufacturer is equal to the amount of discarded drug that exceeds an applicable percentage. And this is by drug, but must be, uh, or is required to be at least 10% of the total charges for the drug given in a calendar quarter. Now, again, complicated information, but understanding what is required for us to meet the regulation or what I would call the, the guidance, the instruction for discarded single dose, single use packaged drugs. In 2023, in the Medicare physician fee schedule, final rule outlines a method to operationalize this statutory requirement and the calendar year 2023 OPPS final rule that we are talking about reiterates the single dose policy, which makes me know that hospital outpatient services will be affected by this. Do, CMS is saying due to the reliance on often incomplete JW modifier data, CMS has codified a JZ modifier to attest to there being no discarded drug amounts of that single dose or single use packaged drugs. However, modifier JW will continue to be used for wasted drug amounts or discounted drug units. To allow for an adjustment period, providers are not required to use this new JZ modifier, which remember, uh, attests to no discarded drug amounts until July 1. And certainly I am hoping or expecting to see additional information about these two modifiers as we go through uh, the uh, initial, what, three months or six months of 2023. Traditional pass-through payment for drugs received uh, eight applications for added device pass-through payments. Uh, one that intervertebral fusion design device did receive preliminary approval uh, and CM CMS has finalized its process to resume using claims data from two years ago or two years prior to set rates for the calendar year. Um, so simply looking at the eight um, that were requested I wanna be sure that, that you understand what those are. I will mention that the 2021 claims data will be used for 2023 rate setting. CMS will not provide any additional quarters of separate payment for any device category. However, CMS will publicly post 
the completed OPPS device pass-through application forms and related materials it does receive from applicants online, excluding certain copyright information, of course, that cannot be released for applications received on or after January 1. So looking at um, what these eight devices, we know that one of those is the Fusion. Um, one received that preliminary approval, four were determined as meeting the qualifications, and the other four devices did not meet one or more of the eligibility criteria. Again, I have been looking for these, have not come across the specific Hicks Fix codes, so you might want to make a, a note that um, as we receive that proposed addendum B from uh, the final rule, we should be able to identify the four that have been added uh, to receive a pass-through payment. Because again, since I'm a reimbursement person, I always want to look and see what should I be receiving payment for. Skin substitutes have been up and down and all over the world is the way I describe it. Um, back, CMS did establish a policy that divides, divides the skin substitutes in a, into a high cost and a low cost group. Um, for 2023, CMS did not finalize its proposal to change the terminology of skin substitutes. However, CMS will continue that policy of assigning to a high or low cost group based on the product's geometric mean unit cost or per day cost relative to that geometric mean unit. I don't know that I've ever seen the policy definition, so I wanted to be sure that I included that so you can understand for the skin substitutes that you may be purchasing, uh, what de determines whether it is a high or low cost group. CMS did state in the final rule, they will host a town hall early in 2023 to further understand the concern regarding the changes in terminology and why we have so many questions about payment policies for these skin substitutes, which as you know, some are very expensive and it has not appeared to me now, personal you know, perspective that skin substitutes are being reimbursed at the amount they should be. But of course I probably need to say as well, I want all services to be reimbursed just a little bit more. One final uh, rule that I wanted to get across is that C1849 is being eliminated. That has been the code in OPPS to report the use of synthetic skin products. CMS did finalize that providers should use product specific HICSPICS codes, which of course we were using before we changed to this high and low cost uh, methodology. All C1849 uh, products or other products assigned a code in the HICSPIX A2XXX series are being assigned to the high cost skin substitutes groups. I am glad to see that because I think it will be more uh, reimbursement in the 2023 inpatient proposed rule, CMS proposed significant changes to how Medicare usable organs are defined and counted in the cost report under the pretense that these changes will ensure the Medicare program is paying only its share of organ acquisition cost. However, CMS has not finalized these policies as proposed, although we know CMS will most likely address these issues in future rulemaking. CMS did finalize a method of accounting for research organs. In other words, if that particular organ uh, is in a research or a clinical study, those have to be treated differently. But CMS is saying uh, payment accuracy will be maintained and organ availability uh, should be there for the research community. 
Also, CMS has finalized its intention. No true instructions or guidance just yet, but they will be addressing potential financial barriers to organ donation after cardiac death. And again, anxiously awaiting that information so that we will understand uh, not only what has to be reported and how, but how that will be uh, reimbursed. So my gosh, a lot of questions uh, answered, I think within the final, final rule, still some to be addressed uh, as we receive guidance, probably through December and certainly through the first uh, month or two of calendar year 2023. Here are the eight procedures that were added to the inpatient only list, and then the 10 procedures that are being removed. I wanted to be sure that you had those. Uh, I'm still receiving questions about the annual deductible for Medicare outpatient care for next year. It's actually decreasing. And then the standard monthly premium for Medicare Part B. Um, Part D for the drug program, basic monthly premium for standard Medicare Part D drug coverage is expected to be about $31.50, and that's a decrease of, of about 2% from this year's. Thank you for joining the presentation today. We will look to see if we have any questions in chat that I can answer. I'm hoping we have a few minutes left for me to answer those. So I will say thank you for joining us and I'll turn the program back over to Jessica. Thank you, Linda. We really appreciate all that incredibly helpful information. I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Um, so we'll, if, if we have a few more seconds if anybody wants to put one in or use the raise your hand button in the participant panel and I can unmute you, you can ask your question um, on your own. While we're here, I do will just, and, and if we'll give everybody a second or two more to put some questions in, um, let everybody know that our spring symposium is coming up in April. It'll be held April 12th through the 14th. Um, and we'll be at Doubletree uh, DTC down in Greenwood Village. We um, hope to see as many of you there as possible. We did get one question about a copy of the slides. The slides are in that chat box and you should be able to download those. I'll keep the webinar open for a few minutes so people have a chance to do that. If you're unable to download them for any reason, don't worry, I will send those out to everyone who is here on this webinar and we'll make sure that you get those. But I don't see any other additional questions. So I think I will go ahead and just thank you, Linda again for being here. Thanks for sharing all your expertise with us. And thank you to all of our attendees for sharing your lunch hour with us. We hope we will see everyone again really soon. Thank you, Jessica. I enjoyed, uh, appreciate your allowing us to present this presentation today. And I wanna say thank you to Kimberly for joining us as well. I know many of you know her. So thanks Kimberly for being here and Jessica for all your help. Yeah. If I can ever answer a question, you see my email address there, I will be glad to do so. It's always, I know you're not gonna believe it, but it's fun for me. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank and everyone have a wonderful Wednesday. Thank you everyone.